We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is Trump Week. We're back to broadcasting on a given Wednesday. And here we have Tim Apicella joining us by phone. And we're going to talk about what's happened, the amazing things that have happened in this past Trump Week. Hi, Tim. Good afternoon, Jay. Yeah, good to talk to you. So let's let's talk about what happened. I guess uh, primarily it's Iran. Let's get right into that. Um, here yeah. we are a few days after the assassination, and there's been a lot of commentary about it. So maybe we need to clear the air and, uh, and find out, you know, where we stand right now, Tim. Can you tell me? Well, I can't tell you where we stand right now because the Gang of Eight have not been briefed that I'm aware of, of the specifics of the, of the assassination and whether or not it was an imminent threat. So, you know, we, the whole news media is doing a lot of speculation, not really knowing the details of why Soleimani was, was taken out. And we know why he was taken out, but why was he taken out at this particular time? Well, I, you know, they haven't really told us, and I don't think they're ever going to tell us. And, and I, they're having some kind of classified meeting with um, some committees in Congress this morning. Um, and uh, the, uh, somehow I think that's going to... That's going to creep out. That's going to leak out what they say. But let me let me make further speculation and say they they really had no immediate reason. Uh, judging from the remarks they've made, though, uh, they were concerned that uh, Soleimani was going to do another attack on other American embassies hither and yon, um, and they they had some razor thin intelligence on that. Uh, that's what we know about it. There wasn't much intelligence. Um, and uh, they were trying to prevent another attack on an American. That, I think that's, I think that's what they're going to say in this in this classified briefing, which will slip out by virtue of uh, okay. one, one congressman or another. Uh, but that's really not enough. Uh, and I don't. Think well, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I mean, let's look at all the speculation that this creates by not having the specifics of why at this time Soleimani was assassinated. Um, the speculation is this is for the election purposes. The you know, wartime president always does much, much better uh, in the election when uh, there's a conflict going on. So, I mean, all this has done is create a whole lot of speculation and conspiracy theories. And it would have been nice to have a, a concrete reason or rationale of why this assassination took place when it did. Well, you know, it strikes me uh, just in this discussion with you that if there was a real reason, an, an immediate reason to assassinate him. Uh, there would have been no significant downside in telling the world about it, or at least telling the American people about it. Because in that case, the whole media result would have been different. Um, and, I, and, I, and I suspect that um, uh, the, the difference would have been that nobody would have, um, you know, charged him with bad judgment. Nobody, the retaliation would not have been appropriate if he had had a really good reason and enunciated it. But I, but I, think, I think that he was uh, being what he always is, a liar. I think he was holding back information, still is. I don't think there's any good intelligence reason uh, for this assassination. And he therefore created the situation we're in now with retaliation and with an ongoing war with Iran and the loss of relationships uh, with our allies. So, uh, I mean, there's so many bad judgment points and what has happened here over the past few days, that it's clear again that, as you say, uh, you know he's playing for his uh, he's playing for war, uh, he's playing to use war as a way to improve his campaign prospects, um, and and he's uh, he being a sole proprietorship uh, president, he hasn't used his uh, chiefs of staff, he he hasn't used his uh, uh, secretary of state or state department, he just tells them what to do and they jump up. Um, he hasn't told Congress, uh, ex except for Lindsey Graham, uh, in advance, and, and he hasn't told the American people. So he's just playing it his own way, defending his, um, his uh, you know, his sole proprietorship government. Uh, I think we ought to be very concerned. On the other hand, right now, he's playing to his base, and he's telling his base he really needs to, you know, uh, vindicate uh, uh, American interests in the Middle East. And he's going to continue to do that. And they love a good fight. I think they're with him. I think, you know, if you look at his uh, ratings here in the next, ne next few days, you'll see that actually he's going to be doing better among his base. 
But among the people who care about the Middle East and care about avoiding wars, endless wars in the Middle East, uh, I, don't, I don't actually think they're going to like it at all. They don't like it, and the world doesn't like it. Um, so uh, the question is, where does that play in the election? Well, again, it's... It's, I'm not, it's not coming out of my mouth that this is exactly what's going on. This is not necessarily the, the rerun of the movie, um, The Tail Wags the Dog. But you have a lot of, you're going to have a lot of people out there saying this is exactly what it's all about. And so, you know, this could have been all avoided, this speculation, this kind of criticism, had he not just shared the information with these, uh, you know, the Intelligence Committee or the Security you know, Committee, the Gang of Eight. And that wasn't done. I mean... Select members, Lindsey Graham, and select members were, were notified of this pending assassination. Now, Lindsey Graham, was, Lindsey Graham was told on the golf course at Mar Lago. I really don't think that counts. Well, with the sole proprietorship of this presidency, I guess it does. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the other thing that's revealed by this is the lawlessness of the administration. It's completely lawless. Uh, the Constitution required in the circumstances a declaration of war. Now they're, you know, hedging by saying uh, we had an imminent threat. I don't think the threat was imminent. They're never going to be able to establish that. We didn't have an imminent well, threat. and they. Well, that's the crux of it, Jay. That's the crux of it. That's the crux of the entire argument. Was this a, a valid assassination? Was this, you know, I mean, obviously this general, General Solomon, uh, Soleimani he was he was like number two in the whole country or number three. So when you take out the number two and number third person of a, of a sovereign nation, that basically does constitute an act of war. So was the imminent threat worth the definition of an act of war? Question mark. Yeah. Well, and and it's, it's also so that's in the Constitution. Um, I think he violated the Constitution. Or well, they've been playing loose and fast with the, the Wars Power Act. They've been, you know, for many conflicts here, they've been playing, you know, Congress has abdicated its authority and its, its right about enforcing that clause. And, uh, you know, that's been, that's been misused for, for decades now. That's true, but this is the ultimate of it. Here we have a very serious action, an assassination of a second-in-command of a major nation in the Middle East. Um, and, you know, there's no good reason for it. He does it all by himself. He does it because of what he had for breakfast. Uh, he does it without talking to his staff, without being thoughtful, without being, you know, and taking the extreme measure. And I, and I blame the Pentagon on this, too. They shouldn't have given that measure if they thought it was so extreme that it would result well, in... Well, let me ask you this, Jay. I mean, I've just heard you list off a number of entities that probably did not get any kind of briefing. What about the Joint Chiefs of Staff? Right. I agree. I'm, I'm saying that. And, uh, and I'm saying that... Uh, you know, so you don't think they had any clue this was going to happen? No, I think, I think they gave him a list of options. Um, and the most extreme option, which I, I'm not sure they told him it was the most extreme option, uh, was the assassination. And he took that option. Uh, I'm not sure he was advised it was the most extreme, but clearly to a reasonable person it would have been the most extreme. He should have known that or he should have asked him about it. After all, you know, after that drone was uh, was shot down by Iran uh, a few months ago, he said, oh, the collateral damage would be 150 people. Uh, so uh, I don't want to do it. That's what he said. He wanted to avoid loss of life. Well, in fact, you know, there were dozens, uh, 30, 40 people, somewhere between 20 and 40 anyway, who were killed in the Soleimani assassination. There was collateral damage there. Uh, but apparently he didn't go through the same kind of examination. Uh, he chose the most extreme option. Uh, they didn't stop him. They didn't tell him, uh, Mr. President, we don't think you should do that. And he rode, he rode right into the valley. So I think what we have here is a president out of control who doesn't uh, care what they say, who doesn't listen to what they say, and who uh, does not have any thoughtful policy in his mind. Uh, at any time in his administration, and certainly going forward, we're going to see more of this. Uh, I, I think he's going to come out okay, at least with his base. Um, that depends on what Iran does. Now, it's very interesting what happened yesterday because, uh, you know, Iran retaliated with a, with a bunch of missiles, a dozen missiles uh, pointed at uh, air bases in Iraq um, that had American troops on them. But apparently there was enough time, enough warning, whether it was by intelligence or, um, or some, other, some other way, uh, they figured out what was going to happen. I mean, I would have been... I would have been scared. Well, you know, Iran has to show face, uh, safe face, I mean, safe yeah. face. Yeah. 
um, particularly after the number two and number third, you know, most important person in Iran has been taken out by the United States. Yeah. So they have to do something and save face. So um, I, I'm actually surprised it went that well, to be honest with you. Oh, I'm surprised. It, I'm well, okay, but I, you know, it could have gone badly too. Um, I, I think, um, you know, part of the early warning system was the fact that they threatened they would do something. And it was incumbent on the American military to harden their, their defenses and to avoid being in the line of fire. I think that's what led them to leave those bases. It was an obvious way to ameliorate the risk, obvious. So uh, yeah. you know, there's no magic there. And I, and I would suspect that Iran knew they were going to do that. They have intelligence too, you know. The bottom, sure. bottom line is this was just a, you know, a, a show of face or a show <laughs> that they don't really mean war. Uh, a show that, uh, they, but they, at the same time, they want to show that they can fight back. Um, now, query, the really big issue is what happens now. So Trump, wisely, I think, in the circumstances, he now is going to impose additional sanctions, whatever that may be, because he's... So he's already announced them this morning, um, economic sanctions, again, economic. So, again, this is the saving face on both sides. So now we have to, re, you know, counter-respond. And how do you how do you respond, saying there's going to be new additional sanctions? It probably won't be followed through or met. Um, but that will de-escalate this, this big tension between these two countries. Right. Well, he said he's going to uh, do sanctions. And a, a query, what are the sanctions the left, you know? He's been imposing maximum sanctions for years. So what else is That's my whole point. He That's my point. Uh, and, then when you, and then when you take that, you know, um, and the fact that uh, he's not, you know, using military force. He's, by saying he's do, doing sanctions, he's saying I'm not going to use military force. Iran... Ayatollah, your move next. And uh, the Ayatollah is not, not going to be inclined to use force again. Rather, it'll be this hit and run thing that Soleimani was doing. You know, every few months uh, somebody gets killed. Every few months there's an attack on a base, and it's often through proxies, not, not the uh, Iranians themselves. And so right. we're going to be back to the regular routine very soon, and it won't be at a level, you know, where Trump can use it to justify other extreme action. And so what have we achieved here exactly? Because if there were plans, Soleimani wasn't the only guy walking around with those plans in his head. Uh, they appointed another second in command and, you know, be, became uh, Soleimani's replacement almost immediately. And uh, they, still have a, they still have a plan, whatever it might be, uh, embassies or otherwise. So we haven't really achieved anything except notoriety of the, wor notoriety of the world and, uh, and oil prices shot up. I think they're, they're coming down today, but uh, last few days they were very threatening. And in fact, we're gonna have a show later today about exactly how that worked, how the oil prices worked and how they will work in view of this tumult in the Middle East. Bottom line is the Middle East is now clearly unstable. That people have declared, countries have declared they're essentially at war. They're, they're, they're putting other countries in their gun sites. Um, everybody is jockeying around the world uh, for position on this. Trump is not a hero. He's generally recognized as a liar um, by everyone in the world except his base. So, I, I, you know, I think this is a measure of the further decline of the United States. There was a huge error. Well, you know, you, you do shine a light on the, uh, the credibility of the president of the United States. And that's why no one really is buying the fact that there was a quote unquote imminent threat. Um, he's lied so many times and so often and for the last three and a half years or three years that no one really believes that an imminent threat was the real deal because his credibility shot. So now we have to see it in person before we believe it. Yeah. Well, we can take a, a short know. break. Uh, we can take a short break, Tim. And when we come okay. back, I'd like to talk about our relationship with Iraq, which is getting very complex uh, and will have implications beyond Iraq in the in the days and weeks to come. Uh, that's Tim Apicella. I'm Jay Fidel. We're doing Trump Week today on a given Wednesday. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, guys. I'm your host, Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So 
do join me. I look forward to seeing you and uh, aloha. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and I'm the host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're on every Wednesday at four o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV, to windmills, to hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at four o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live after that break on the other side, so to speak, with Tim Apicella, J. Fidel, that's me. We're talking about Trump week. We're talking about the amazing week we've had over the past few days. It seems like all the news that you could have in months has been jammed into, you know, like 48, 72 hours. Anyway, uh, so one of the issues I wanted to cover, Tim, uh, was uh, our relationship with Iraq. It's been declining. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, Iran has greater influence. It's been vying for influence with various proxy groups, militia, what have you. Those are the guys that uh, attacked the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad in the Green Zone not too long ago, two days ago. And so, um, you know, we, we need to take a look at our relationship, U.S. relationship. Now, they, they said they wanted, to, they wanted us out of there. And in response, um, you know, our Secretary of State, who really should never have said this, um, said, well, they don't really mean it because uh, the people, the people uh, of, of Iraq didn't, the, the legislature, the government didn't really represent the people. And we were going to stay there, no matter what they said. Oh. So, you know. Well, you know, when you, you have the Iraqi parliament vote 179 to zero, that they want the United States out, um, that's not just the people, that's the government, the government that <laughs> represents their people. Yeah. So, I mean, you have the government speaking, such as it is, telling us to leave, and we don't leave. We ignore them. What are we then? We're an interloper. Uh, we're, we're, well, we're, we're an occupying force. That's right. Um, the way I look at it, I mean, yeah. we, here we are, allies, now suddenly converted to an occupation force. Yeah. Um, that's not a good status for us to be in. No, and, and we're going to lose that because uh, none of this um, means that Iran is less influential in, in uh, Iraq. I think it becomes more influential in Iraq. And the U.S. is, um, you know, less in favor. So here, after spending trillions of dollars, um, you know, on um, liberating Iraq from Saddam Hussein, what have you, and trying to rebuild their government and infrastructure, how much money we spent, how many lives we spent, do that, now they want us out of there. Uh, and instead, they're going to take Iran instead. What, what have so we Jay, achieved? Well, we're on this topic. Um, did you have any comments about the Pentagon paper, the draft? letter of the Pentagon saying that we were going to have, you know, troop movements out of Iraq, or how did that happen? <laughs> it was only a draft. Now I've heard everything. They say they're going to... Well, they had a letter. Them. I've never seen a draft with letterhead on it, but yeah, technically it was a draft because it was not signed. I've never seen a technique so obvious uh, in a walkback. So all of a sudden, <laughs> a, a, what appears to be a final statement is a draft, and it's 180 different. Uh, than what they ultimately say. We are, we, we are totally incredible. Anybody watching the news on this, anybody reading the paper, even watching any of the TV stations, has got to find us to be completely incredible. Uh, the, the, well, go the government doesn't hold a, a, a truth on anything, um, and it makes things up uh, from a dark place. But let's, in, in terms of that, let's talk about uh, Trump's uh, speech, his, uh, his long well, speech the other day, yesterday, on, on what, what we should be thinking here. Well, I, I think that what really floored me was the time and attention he, he has to, I mean, by, by compulsion, he has to bring Obama's administration back to the front, you know, three years later on how um, it's Obama's fault that he gave that money back as far as the um, missile agreement to, to give back the money that he keeps saying it's United States money, and that money has bought these missiles, and those missiles are you know now attacking um, the air base in, in Iraq. And does he not know that that was Iran's money back in 1978-79 when we froze it for decades? Does he not realize that this was their money to begin with? It's, it didn't come out of the IRS treasury, or you know, um, he just can't he can't get himself straight on that point. And he makes himself look quite ridiculous 
when he keeps bringing Obama's administration in on this payment. Well, that, that, and that takes us to the, you know, the, the peace agreement they made, which is now asunder. Um, you know, o Obama's efforts at trying to bring peace to that area and trying to minimize the risk of nuclear war, uh, those are asunder now. In fact, uh, you know, the Iranians said yesterday that uh, they were not going to abide by any provision at all in that agreement, and that they are proceeding with all due speed uh, to build nuclear weapons. Well, thank you, Mr. Trump. Uh, that's certainly a step ahead. So here we are, gaining nothing, but losing any shred of a non-nuclear Iran. Um, it's uh, remarkable how much damage has been done, uh, but he denies that. He, think, he tells us we should sleep well. Uh, it's very hard to sleep well when the Middle East is devolving into violence and when that violence will probably uh, you know, spread to other places in the world. Uh, and in any event, we look like we are declining. Uh, the you know, I'm, I'm having American deja vu. Power. I'm having deja vu moments of my history classes um, of when Bismarck was trying to advise the Kaiser of how to avoid World War One or entering and stumbling into a war, and I, I, it just it just reminds me of those history lessons. Well, and, that's, that's true. I, you know, uh, there was a book, a very famous history book by a history professor at uh, Columbia. Uh, Barbara Tuckman was her name. And uh, she wrote a book called the, the Guns of August. And the Guns of August was a discussion of the factors that led to World War I. Um, and what happened uh, in, in the run-up to World War I was everybody had a war plan. <clears throat> uh, and it was like uh, programmed. It was triggered. Uh, so if this happened, then you responded with that. And if that happened, you responded with this. And everybody had a plan. And when the, the, the Archduke of Serbia was, was killed, uh, the, the, those plans began executing uh, all over Europe. Uh, this, this tit for tat, tit for tat, tit for tat. And before you know it, out of one single assassination, you got it, one single assassination, we have a world war. Because all those plans went ahead on their own, automated. Uh, is there a difference? I mean, this is so reminiscent of what happened in 1914. Well, that's why I bring the point up. I, I, it, 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 it almost appears very similar in a lot of ways. And, you know, the fact that um, in this case, I don't think there's plans. I think it's the lack of plans that could make us stumble into, you know, a, a complete Middle East crisis and, and, you know, all sorts of um, things that you didn't anticipate. That's how wars, that's what happens with wars. You don't anticipate that which could happen. Right, and things move so so quickly these days with social media, with the news, with immediate communication everywhere. Um, so that w whatever the plans are or the non-plans are, these events can get away from you in no time. Um, <clears throat> and let me add one other factor and see what your reaction is. You know, you have to, I think it's clear that we have to look at this from two levels. One is what the media, what the leadership is saying, because often, if not in Trump's case, always, it's not true. And his secretary of state, it's not true. Um, and his uh, attorney general, it's not true. Um, so you have this sort of level of, um, of, 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 of lying. And uh, then you have the reality. And so the, the level of lying does affect history as it moves, moves forward, because some people accept it, they, or they look into it for truth, um, and that affects their, their counter moves going forward. Some countries affect their counter moves going forward. On the other hand, there is something under the surface, and that is the reality. What really happened here? We, don't, we, we can't learn it from the statements of the American government uh, because they, they're not credible. Um, but there is some remarkable you know, undercurrent of facts and events which we may or may not understand. I mean, I think the best, the best of our press tries to find out and tells us about that. But you have two sources of information. What do I say? Alternative facts. And you can pick what facts you like. Republicans are, Republicans are supporting Trump to the hilt in all of this. Uh, the Senate, mostly Republicans, are supporting Trump to the hilt in this. And so, you know, you pick the facts you like, you pick the alternative set of facts you like, and you go on that. And it's not limited to the base. It's not limited to the Republicans. It's the whole world. So what you get is 
very uh, remarkable facts, very uh, provocative facts, um, and you get two sets of them. Uh, confusion reigns, and confusion is the you know is the is the the mother of all wars, uh, lying, deception, um, uh, an un a misunderstandings, well, and confusion lead to war. Yeah. Don't say it as the first time of war is the truth. And, um, you know, one thing that I'm reacting to is just when you're speaking, is we haven't begun to explore the unintended consequences of the damage that's been wrought upon our allies in Europe. Um, you know, it's untold damage. They, they got no heads up. And, you know, their forces were exposed, their embassies were exposed as well. And, you know, I just thought with my mind that. This action could have taken place so quickly without so few of our allies on board with us before we did this. So who's the main beneficiary of this, as usual? All of Trump's Mr. Mistake. Putin. Mr. Putin is the huge beneficiary. And Mr. Putin is now closer to China than he was before. And indeed, they're having meetings and military exercises right now. Uh, so what's happened is we have marginalized ourselves yet again. We have made fools of ourselves yet again. We have created consternation and uh, uh, dissembling in the Middle East with threats to so many of our allies, including especially Israel, because uh, there were threats about missiles and, and terror in uh, Haifa and in Tel Aviv. So what have we achieved here? And the answer is nothing. And I, I, you know, I, gotta, I gotta say that Trump has done a good job to try to walk back and correct himself um, you know, to, to show that uh, maybe there was some some reason that he can't tell us about, which we which we should rely on. But the fact is that he has dissembled the Middle East only to Putin's benefit. And I think we have to watch very carefully what happens. Yeah, I wanted to get your reaction to your thoughts about when he um, like cultural site as being target number one, and then your thoughts about what he said in the speech that. United Kingdom, Germany, France, Russia, China, all had to get in line with us as we try to forge out basically a new a new um, nuclear arms reduction for Iran. Yeah. I mean, I almost thought that was comical. Well, we're out of time, but let me answer it in the short way, is when I heard that, uh, I didn't believe it. There was no information to that effect, and there was no confirmation from any of those countries. I think more likely they are still in wonderment about what in the world he's doing. Anyway, let's follow it this week, Tim. Let's get together okay. next Wednesday. I look forward to our next Trump week, uh, Wednesday, a week from now. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you, Jay, for having me. Aloha. Aloha.